Hello and here we are at the start of the second section of our look at the castles of Northumberland and in this section we'll be looking at the coastal castles. Once again we'll be working from the north to the south and we begin here on the iconic island of Lindisfarne known more commonly by us Northumbrians as Holy Island. In 634 AD, King Oswald of Northumbria summoned a monk called Aidan from Iona in the Inner Hebrides to be the bishop of his kingdom, residing on Lindisfarne Island, which is one of the main reasons it became more commonly known as Holy Island. And I think I'm right in saying it is also regarded as the starting place for Christianity in Britain. In 793 the island was invaded by Vikings and the site was desecrated. Everyone, absolutely everyone was massacred. After the Norman invasion of 1066 the monastery was re-established and the monastic community prospered. During the border wars with Scotland, the monastery had to be fortified to withstand Scottish attacks. In 1534, Henry VIII ordered the destruction of the monastery in his dissolution of the Catholic Church. It took till 1542 to completely demolish it, and in 1549 he ordered that the stone be used from the monastery to build the castle. The castle gave Henry a northern port within easy reach of Berwick uh, and the border in controlling the Scots. The castle is built on an outcrop of volcanic rock called Beblo Crag, which is an offshoot of the Great Windsill. A vast outcrop of volcanic rock which spewed out some 295 million years ago. You will recall we talked about this in the coast video last year. After the union of the crowns in 1603, Lindisfarne Castle had no further military purpose until the English Civil War when it was held by the Royalists. During the Anglo-Dutch War of 1672 to 1674, which was primarily a naval conflict, Osborne's Fort, that you can see there just behind me, um, was built to further protect the natural harbour. Some military presence remained here until 1816. After that, the castle was used as a coast guard station. By 1900, it was in ruins and bought in 1901 for private ownership. In 1944, it was gifted to the National Trust by the last owner and it remains with the National Trust today.
If you look over onto the horizon, uh, that is where we're going next, and of course that is Bamborough. Well, here we are in Bambra on yet another beautiful day, blustery but gorgeous. Bambra has been used many times as a film location and most recently for the Indiana Jones latest movie. Um, it was also the setting for the Netflix The Last Kingdom. Although the castle itself wasn't actually filmed in the series, um, it was the basis of the um, program. Um, and of course it featured uh, Alexander Draymond as Uhtred, son of Uhtred. There's been a settlement here since prehistoric times known as Dingari occupied by the indigenous Celtic Britons. Bambra sits on a plug of volcanic dolomite. It's part of the Great Wind Sill. The original fort was most likely of timber and earth construction. In Roman times it was used as part of the shore defences against the raiding Saxons. In 547 AD, Bambra was captured by the Anglo-Saxon king Ida, who made it the capital of his new kingdom of Bernicia. In 600 AD, the castle passed to Ethelfrith, who gave the castle to his wife Beba. The early name for Bambra was Bebenburg, and this is where the name was derived. In 654, when Bernicia merged with Deira to form the Kingdom of Northumbria, Bambra's status was elevated again. Deira is the area known as Durham today, but also uh, a, a large part of North Yorkshire. Hence its name Northumberland, land north of the Humber River. Bambra remained in Anglo-Saxon hands until 993 AD when it was attacked and destroyed by Vikings. After the Normans arrived in Britain, uh, a new castle was built on the site consisting of the square tower in the centre of the castle that you see today. By 1086, the castle had passed to Robert de Mowbray, uh, a Norman made Earl of Northumbria. He started a rebellion against King William II, the son of William the Conqueror. William sent an army against him, so Mowbray barricaded himself into the castle. When William failed to besiege the castle, he built a temporary siege castle beside it so frequent attacks could be made. Mowbray tried to escape and made it as far south as Tynemouth, where he was captured. Although his wife held out at Bamborough for a while, she was forced to surrender and the castle and its lands transferred to the crown. In 1464, during the War of the Roses, it became the first castle in England to be defeated by artillery after a nine-month siege by Richard Neville. After Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries, the castle was given to Sir John Forster and it remained in that family till 1704 when the last of the Forster family died bankrupt. Bambra was partially restored by a board of trustees appointed to govern the castle, but it was the Victorian industrialist William Armstrong who completed the restoration in 1894 when he became the owner. The castle is still owned by the uh, Armstrong family today.
Next we're off a little bit further down the coast uh, to Dunstanborough. Well, here we are again on another fantastic day here in Northumberland and this is the site for another dramatic cliff top castle on the beautiful Northumberland coast. This time we're at Dunstanborough Castle which lies between Embleton in the north and Craster in the south. Um, and Dunstanborough Castle was built by Thomas Earl of Lancaster between 1313 and 1322 um, on the site of an Iron Age fort. The original castle covered an area of 9.95 acres and included three artificial lakes within the outer curtain wall making it the largest castle in Northumberland in its day. Thomas was the cousin and most powerful subject in King Edward II's court. As the dispute between the king and the nobles wore on, Thomas switched allegiance and sided with the nobles. So the castle was built in anticipation of hostilities between them. Thomas was captured at the Battle of Borough Bridge in 1322 and executed. The castle became the property of the Crown before passing to the Duchy of Lancaster. The Duchy of Lancaster is the private estate of the British Sovereign to provide an um, independent source of income. The castle's defences were extended in 1380 due to the peasant unrest following the plague. In 1455, Dunstanborough became the northern stronghold during the Wars of the Roses and changed hands several times between the houses of York and Lancaster under constant siege. The castle never recovered from the battles and has laid derelict ever since. Dunstanborough was sold into private ownership as a ruin to the Grey family in 1604 by James I of England, who of course was also James VI of Scotland and had just united the crowns of England and Scotland. So Dunstanborough was no longer needed as a royal fortress. There is no evidence that the Greys did anything with the castle but it is thought that they may have used some of the stone to build their bathing house just south of Craster uh, at Howick. In 1704 the castle passed to Lady Mary Grey who turned the outer bailey over to the growing of crops and most of the outer walls were robbed of stone for other buildings. In the 1860s, Lady Mary's descendants, heavily in debt, sold the castle to the trustees of Samuel Eyre's estate, and although some preservation was carried out on the gatehouse, no further restoration was done. In the early years of the 1900s, the castle was sold to a wealthy ship owner, Sir Arthur Sutherland, who added a golf course where the bailey once was, and began clearing the land. During the Second World War, the Royal Armoured Corps were based here and added an anti-tank ditch to the north end of the moat in case of a German invasion. In 1961, Sutherland's son, Sir Ivan Sutherland, passed the Dunstanborough estate to the National Trust and the site is managed by English Heritage. Warkworth Castle is another iconic castle in Northumberland. We're just a mile or two inland from Amble and the estuary of the River Coquet. So I've included it in the coastal castles because it sort of is. The site where Warkworth Castle sits 
is on a narrow neck of land formed by a loop in the river Cocot as it meanders around a steep sided hill providing strong natural defences. It is thought the site was occupied in Neolithic times and fortified during the Iron Age. The earliest record of a settlement is in 737 AD when Seawulf, King of Northumbria, granted it to Lindisfarne Priory. It was known as Worse Word, meaning home of the worse people. Worse was the name of an abbess who gave linen for the venerable Bede's shroud at Lindisfarne. In 849 AD, Osbert was king of English Northumbria succeeding Ethelred II. He was deposed by a usurper by the name of Allah who had no claim to the kingdom. However, they joined forces in 866 AD and seized Worsward and attempted to march on York which was held by the Danes. Both were killed in 867 AD. Worsward then became the property of the Earls of Northumbria and a high status residence was built on the site. The earliest castle was a timber, mott and bailey and may have been built by Prince Henry of Scotland who was the Earl of Northumberland at that time. Other opinions are that King Henry II built the castle when he took control of the northern counties of England in 1157 AD. In 1173, Warkworth, as it became known, was attacked by William I of Scotland, or William the Lion as he was known, and most of the population was slaughtered. The castle lay in ruins until 1199, when the owner Robert Fitzroger completely rebuilt it, more or less as you see it today. The rebuilding was sufficiently grand to attract King John to stay here in 1213. During the Wars of Independence with the Scots, the owner of Walkworth was Robert de Clavering and he was captured in 1297 at the Battle of Stirling Bridge by William Wallace. Following the English defeat at Bannockburn in 1314, Walkworth became an important stronghold and its garrison was hugely increased to counter Robert the Bruce's raids into England. In 1328, King Henry III granted Walkworth to Henry de Percy, who was the most powerful magnate in the north at that time. Some modifications were made in 1380 and the Percy descendants and Earls of Northumberland made Walkworth their main residence. The Percy family were strong supporters of the crown, but after Richard II became unpopular with the nobles, Henry Hotspur Percy, as he was known, captured Richard and forced him to surrender the crown to Henry IV in 1399. King Henry promised Percy uh, lands and money and royal favour in return for his help. But when this um, favour was given to a rival instead of Percy, he turned against King Henry, accusing him of perjury. In 1403, Henry Percy raised an army of 200 men and marched south to attack the king. Percy was killed in the Battle of Shrewsbury that same year and all Percy lands, including Walkworth, were forfeited to the crown. In 1416, King Henry V gave Warkworth back to the Percy family, who gave support to the King's wars in France. The Percys were in control of the Eastern Marches, the main route to Scotland, and four major castles, Warkworth, Annick, Dunstanborough and Bamborough. All were defeated in the War of the Roses by Richard Neville and his army, and once again the Percys lost their lands. Switching sides and swearing allegiance to the House of York in 1471, King Edward IV restored the Percys' inheritance. The 
Percys stayed loyal to the Yorkists until the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. The Percys were meant to provide support to Richard III in the battle, but they refused to fight, leaving Richard III to be killed and Henry Tudor, Henry VII, to take the throne, ending the War of the Roses. Henry Percy was murdered four years later. Warkworth once again passed into crown ownership until Mary I, or Bloody Mary as she was known, gave it back to the Percys in 1557. However, in 1569 the castle was seized because Thomas Percy rebelled against Elizabeth I and although he tried to flee to Scotland, he was caught and executed in York. In 1574, the castle again was given back to the Percys, but had begun to decline with years of neglect. By 1603, with the union of England and Scotland, the border fortress of Warkworth was superfluous. The ninth Earl, another Henry Percy, was implicated in the gunpowder plot of 1605, and he was imprisoned in the Tower of London. Walkworth Castle had to be leased to pay the £30,000 fine and that was the last of the Percys to live at the castle. Sir Ralph Grey of nearby Chillingham Castle took the lease but neglected the castle and allowed stone to be removed for other projects. By the Second English Civil War in 1648, Walkworth was a partial ruin and when the parliamentary forces departed in 1649, they further demolished it to prevent it being used. The castle was never rebuilt and further stone was robbed to build Churton Hall in 1670. Walkworth remained in the Percy family and is still part of their estates today. In 1984, it was given to English heritage to manage and they are the custodians of the site today. If you're planning on a visit to Walkworth, a good time to come is late March, early April. Um, the mound that the castle is built on is absolutely covered in daffodils and looks absolutely beautiful. Evidence of settlements here at Cress will go back to prehistoric times. Thousands of flint tools have been found over the years at Lyne Hill, which is close by. The area would have been dense woodland covered in oak and alder trees. Evidence of that can be found on the edge of the shoreline when the spring tides are very low. Cresswell Castle is a peel tower built in the 15th century by the Cresswell family and is one of about 175 towers that are littered all over Northumberland. Its origins were simply to provide a secure dwelling in a time when the border reavers ran amok. The reavers were bands of lawless men from one or more families on both sides of the border who stole cattle and goods. They had no allegiance to either Scottish or English crowns, only to each other. The need to survive lay behind centuries of violence. While most of England was peaceful and prosperous, the border people needed peel towers like this with thick walls to survive. Cresswell Tower was a typical peel tower, three storeys high. The ground floor was accessed by a narrow doorway um, and used for storage and winter shelter for livestock. 
The idea being that their body heat would rise and help keep the building warm. A very narrow spiral staircase led up from the doorway. Um, this was designed so that the stairway could easily be defended by restricting an intruder from swinging a sword. The first floor would be one large hall, kitchen and living space, while the second floor would provide sleeping quarters. In 1750, a large mansion house was built onto the side of the tower, however this was demolished in 1845. You can clearly see where the stone has been channelled and the roof of the hall would have abutted the tower. The tower is said to be haunted by a white lady. The legend is that Cresswell's daughter fell deeply in love with a Danish prince and they planned to elope and be married. As the prince landed on Cresswell shore, he was ambushed and killed by her jealous brothers. She was so grief stricken, she died of a broken heart soon after and a ghost can be seen occasionally uh, on the tower roof looking out to sea. During the 1800s, the Cresswells inherited great fortune from rich relatives and built Cresswell Hall, a grand mansion. For reasons unclear, by 1924, the house was sold to Northumberland County Council in poor condition and it had to be demolished in 1930. The site is presently owned by Park Dean Resorts. That concludes this section on the coastal castles. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already done so and click on that notification bell to receive updates of the latest releases. Next, we're off up north again to look at the northern castles and this one includes a favourite, Annick. <laughs>